Well, it's great to have a chance to be together this morning, and I am so grateful for the worship that we've just experienced and for the reminder that it is as we begin a day of thinking about what it means to love LA, that we are here to think about the connection between worship and everything else that we see. It's interesting that in the Bible, one of the most intense connections exists between whether our worship actually transforms the way that we perceive our neighbor. This is one of the greatest, most thematically central themes of the Bible. And it's the reason why both major and minor prophets are so full of anger and disappointment that Israel worships Yahweh on the one hand and fails to see Yahweh's world in the way that Yahweh does. This comes to so many peak moments, but one of them is in Isaiah 58 when the prophet having described the worship of Israel then says again, you, you practice as if worship, as if you were actually interested in the things that I'm interested in. But it belies the fact that you really don't seem to care about what I'm interested in. And it is evident by the fact that your worship doesn't translate into the ability to see your neighbor in the way that I see the people that are around you. And in particular, it doesn't seem to translate in your ability to be able to see and perceive those who are at the margins. If our worship doesn't transform our ability to see our society and our culture, and especially those that are in vulnerable places, then the prophet says, I hate your worship. The challenge is how do we grow into being people who connect and see that the glory of God, the God that we've just sung about, the God who is holy, a God who out of that holiness and righteousness perceives the world in a way that now is meant to transform how we see the world. We begin this morning by thinking about the social needs of LA, but we don't come to it just as a sociologist. We, we come to it specifically as Christian people who are seeking to see the city in the way that God sees the city. This is partly, I think, what happens in the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus picks up on those themes that the prophets speak about it and wants to give us a new vision, a new vision of many things. In the five through seven of Matthew, what we see is this portrait of a, of a reordered reality, a reordered use of power. This is central. Our worship transforms our understanding of power because it's grounded in the reality and character of God. And now ultimately in Jesus Christ made known in an unexpected use of vulnerable power in response to a vulnerable and needy world. And then he offers us this instruction in, throughout Matthew, but for example, especially in the Sermon on the Mount, of a recalibrated use of power. When we think about the society that is LA, when we think about the societies that are LA, the culture and cultures that are LA, one of the most important things is whether we can see it in a way that is about God's way of perceiving and using power. Every society and culture is organized around various power structures and patterns. There was an article a number of years ago in the Wall Street Journal about the growing popularity of private jet travel. And in this article that it focused in on one widget maker who'd become a gazillionaire who could fly privately, he said it all turned for him on one day when he was flying from one coast to the other. There was a woman who was crying with a, with a baby that was crying in business. He said, that settled it. I'm never going to fly commercial again. And then he gave his, his mission statement and it was this. He said, because I've decided that the really important thing to me is to exclude from my life anyone who might bum me out. Okay, let's just kind of meditate on that for just a minute. Because I've decided that the really important thing to me is to exclude from my life anyone who might bum me out. Now, when I first read that, I thought, oh, that's just disgusting. And then I thought, well, that's um, awkwardly familiar, actually. I don't practice it at the elite level he does, but my life and your life is organized around how we avoid people who might bum us out. Is this not why we have caller ID on our phones? Is this not what Mark Zuckerberg understood so well in making it possible to friend and unfriend people on Facebook? Because we come near and step away. As people who are called to love LA and to perceive the needs of LA, we begin with our own social location and that is never neutral. Wherever we begin, it's never neutral. I can only, as my experience is, I can only ever perceive the world through the eyes of being a tall, white, educated male. But in the kingdom of God, God wants to enlarge that sociology. God wants to reorder that way of seeing. God wants to give me a bigger heart and a 
wider mind and a greater capacity for love and a deeper ability to perceive across the lines of people who might bum me out, but who are actually the people that Jesus loves. And if I'm seeking to be, and we're seeking to be people who perceive LA out of that heart of love, then it's meant to transform our social vision. For me, one of the ways this has been most helpful has been to just literally walk the streets of any town that I've ever lived in, any city that I've ever been in, and to just pray as I walk regularly in various settings, Lord, give me your vision for this neighborhood, these people, that person, these circumstances. Now, all this becomes sort of dramatically tangible at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. You remember that Jesus concludes the sermon by saying that in this world of reordered power, reordered by the character of the kingdom of God, that in that world where we're meant to love, not just those who love us, but even those who bum us out, or even those who Jesus says are actually our enemies, we're supposed to love in a way that demonstrates an unexpected capacity to extend grace and mercy and love. And then at the end of the sermon, Jesus says, and by the way, I don't want to hear you stand at the back door and say, good sermon, pastor. I want you to actually live what I've just said. And so he tells the parable of the rock and the sands. And he says, basically, whether you build on rock or sand is dependent on whether you actually do the truth. So the great theme of this conference is not just to gain a new way of seeing, but then a new way of acting that connects the way that we perceive with how we actually live in the world. And in Matthew, this is so fascinating because the very next thing that happens after Jesus gives this great teaching, and Matthew observes that, that all those who heard Jesus teach were just astounded because he taught as one who had authority. In Matthew's language, that's because what Jesus said and what Jesus did were the same thing. Voice and touch were intimately connected. And in that world, then the very next thing that happens in Matthew chapter eight is that Jesus walks down from the mountain, it says, and the very first person that he encounters is a leper. In that context, as we probably all know, there was nobody that was more of a symbol of re religious impurity than a leper. Someone who had to walk down the streets of everyday life simply saying to anyone who might come near, unclean, unclean, unclean. And Jesus, in this moment then, has to ask and demonstrate for himself the connection between voice and touch and for his followers that the sermon wasn't just a set of words, but a new way of living. And the leper says, if you will or wish, you could make me clean. And Jesus says, I do will. And he touches the leper and cleanses them. See, the thing about a new social vision is not just an intellectual framework. It's not just a new kind of paradigm. Heavens knows that would be a lot. I mean, it's a lot to actually change our social vision. It's a lot to move beyond our own ethnic and economic and social category. It's a lot to actually come to know an other, a person who really truly is not like us, to let alone stand then in their space, identify with them and love them. That's what Jesus does at this moment. He hears and responds to the leper and touches the leper and engages the leper and serves the leper the social vision of LA that's going to be transformative is not just a new paradigm, it's going to be a new way of the church living in the world where what we say and what we do is actually transformed into one whole reality. And it's gonna call us to live across lines differently than we may have done before. LA, like so many cities, is a place that has proximate community but not genuine community. It has proximate community in that it's a dense place and it has people of all different kinds of ethnicities and backgrounds and circumstances, but it's only proximate. It happens that we're nearby each other, but it may or may not be that we actually cross over. A recent study suggested, for example, that something like 86% of white people in America have no African-American friends. Does that mean they don't know any African-Americans? Almost surely not. Many, many, many white people know African-Americans, but no African-American friends. No sense that they've actually stepped into somebody else's territory, actually experienced that friendship, learned to see and perceive and feel the world through somebody's paradigm that is not their own. 
how significant it is that this gathering is an attempt to try to say to us, we need to move toward action because of the character of God that always moves across that boundary and into an unexpected and new relationship. And in that context, we're meant to be people who demonstrate the reality of that kind of change. The next thing that happens in Matthew's gospel is that then Jesus encounters the centurion. It was quite a lot to encounter somebody who might have stained a pure Jew. But now to encounter a centurion is to encounter somebody who's an oppressor, a threat, a danger, someone worth fearing. And the centurion approaches Jesus asking for healing for his servant. Jesus says, I'll come. The man says, no, no, you don't need to come. The way it works is I know how this is with power. I'm a military guy. I get it. You say the word and it'll be done. All you need to do is say the word. Jesus slows down the action in this unexpected way. Now it's not the servant that's in view, but the man who's just express this amazing faith. And Jesus hears from the voice of the one who holds Roman authority and power. Do you hear this, he says to his disciples? I have not heard faith like this in all of Israel. There are some who are thinking that because of their birthright, they're gonna be found in the inner ring, but they're gonna be found in the outer darkness. And there are some who may think that they're in the outer darkness who are gonna be found in the inner ring because of the kind of faith that this man expresses. And then Jesus goes on and heals the man's servant. See, the thing is that Jesus says first with the leper, I want you to love in tangible terms those who you think may be able to stain you. And I want you to learn to love those people and hear those people who may even be a threat to you. Why? Because the kingdom of God reorganizes the way that we see. And it's meant to call us to reorganize the way that we then act, the actual relationships of people who are not like us. This conference will only amount to something that's really going to be a part of transforming LA, loving LA, embodying LA, not by singing worship songs in the context of LA, unless our worship songs lead us to transformative action, unless we worship by the way that we love our neighbor, and the way that we love our neighbor, not in the way that just reflects my sociology, but reflects more and more of the heart of the kingdom of God that loves beyond the social categories and the framework and the paradigm that I've seen. There was a guy who was attending the church that I was a pastor of for many years in Berkeley. He'd been notable and there for a couple of weeks, partly because he had flaming tattoos that came up to his cheekbones. You could see it for, even from the pulpit and I had looked for the opportunity to connect with him. One day, finally, we had a chance to talk. He said, yeah, I've been a traveling musician for uh, about 15 years. I've come back to graduate school. I'm now at Cal. I'm trying to figure out things about life that I really had put on the shelf. Religion and faith was one of those things. I've started attending various churches and I've started coming to your church. I go to some churches in Berkeley and I hear a lot about the world, but very little about Jesus. I go to other churches, I hear a lot about Jesus, but I hear very little connection about the world that I live in. I go to your church, I hear a lot about Jesus and a lot about the world. But what I wanna know is this, if, if I come to your church regularly and I get to know people there, will I actually meet people that are like Jesus? I looked at his face for any sign that this was a cynic or that it was a joke, but there was nothing but just earnest desire. He said, I can find all kinds of people that are like me all around me. I don't need more people like me in my life. That's the point. I wanna know if there's real hope in a world that I live in. And that would mean that if I go to a church that lifts up Jesus and seeks to love the world, will I meet people that are actually like Jesus? Is that what we're trying to cultivate in Together LA? Is that what we're trying to cultivate in our churches? Is that the love, the social love that lands in real time and space with people who might stain us, who might threaten us, who are different than we are. Are we able to love in that way? That's the call. And it will be costly, as Jesus said. Later in Matthew, it will become evident that Jesus himself is going to a cross and he'll say, and in fact, if you're gonna follow me, you're going to a cross. Peter really didn't think this was a good idea even for Jesus to go to a cross, let alone to go there himself. But that was the call. One day I was on a plane about to take off. I had worked on a, working on a manuscript that was about loving my neighbor. And in that context, I'd laid the manuscript on my seat, put my 
case above me, got into the seat, sat down, and it was really early in the morning, about six o'clock, and kind of an unusual sight, an 80-something-year-old lady was sitting next to me, and I could just tell she was going to be a talker. And I wasn't really looking for that opportunity, and I was feeling really badly about this manuscript, and it wasn't going the way that I wanted it to go. She said, I wonder if I could just ask you a few questions about those papers. I said, yeah, what, what about them? She said, are those your papers? I said, yeah, they are my papers. Does that mean that you wrote those papers? Um, yeah, I said, that, that's what that means, right, I did. And so what are those papers about? I said, well, I'm thinking to myself, well, it's really about what to do with annoying people who talk to you about six o'clock in the morning. I said, well, it's really just about how do, you, how do we love each other? How do we care for each other? She sat there for a while, kind of wringing her hands. I just knew we weren't done. She said, um, I wonder if I could just ask one more question. Is that a work of fiction? I said, no. And then I said, well, maybe. And I sat sort of transfixed for the rest of the flight. Is this whole talk about loving LA a work of fiction? Is it an elaborate sociological scheme to organize us to talk a certain way? Or is it going to be translated into concrete action that changes social behavior in a city that desperately needs not just proximate community, but genuine community, that loves not just in the social categories of our ethnicity or our nationality or our economic class, but actually loves in a way that demonstrates the character of God. This is our call. This is what we are committed to at Fuller. This is what this movement is committed to. This is why I'm excited about the new opportunities that there are to plant churches, to, but they need to be churches that grow in their maturity to be able to be established in a way that demonstrates an unexpected love. And LA desperately needs that kind of love. And the only way that it's not a work of fiction is if we actually live it. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.